This is a more than just podcast production. Hey, everybody, welcome to episode 375 of the More Than Just Code podcast. My name is Tim Mitchell. I am in Toronto, Ontario, and I'm joined by Steve Lipton in Honolulu, Hawaii. Aloha. My name, he's, it's first thing in the morning for him, and it's, you know, mid, mid-afternoon mid for me, so time zones are fun. Very much so. Well, I was going to say, as, as I find out every morning, because I still work on in central time, so I'm up ah. at three. Oh, uh, really? Walk, wander over to my computer and start and start doing my daily work, so. Yeah, I think you said the office is in Chicago? The office is in Chicago, yeah. Yeah, so you're on central time. Cool. I was working on central time, but for me, it was an advantage as I got to show up an hour late for work, you know, because <laughs> you know, walk the dog in the morning, then then go to check in at the office and things. That was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, cool. So I just want to get a, a sense of, of kind of what you're up to. I know right now you've got a, you've got a Porsche that's going to be coming out at some point in the future. I've seen some talks by you in the past, and I've, I've enjoyed some of your previous courses. And um Last bunch were on playgrounds, but is that sort of where you're focusing these days? I'm focusing on a bunch of new stuff for me. Uh, some of it is brand new. The the one I'm working on right now is the uh, is Swift Data, and we're going to be putting together. I'm, I'm in recording phase now, and then we'll start going into editing phase hopefully next week for uh, creating a course on Swift Data for beginners who have absolutely no idea what they're doing. Right. Uh, so if there's people who know core data. This is going to not have anything to do with core data. It's not going to take a core data approach to it. Uh, I'm doing this from uh, from a new perspective, as long as you understand Swift UI and trying to get the two of those together. So the focus is going to be like Mac, iPad, or sorry, iOS, iPad. Um, kind iOS, of focus? iPad. Yeah, we're actually going to use an iPad. I have a um, one of the things I do with my courses. If anyone's ever taken any of the ones from LinkedIn Learning, is I've created my own universe where these courses happen Mm -hmm. and so all the demos are related and it's both the ones that have to do with ios and ipad os and even the ones i do outside of that for business stuff for the sap business one stuff that i do and it all rotates it all centers around a company called the hula pizza pizza company and hula pizza it's a small little pizza company that got started by a bunch of surfers who decided they like their pizza differently than everybody else um so the story in the Swift Data one is we're on an iPad now because this is going to be their ordering system on the tables for um, ordering pizza. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So is, is Playgrounds going to enter into it, or, or is that something that... No, no. This time, this time I'm not going to be doing Playgrounds. Um, I wasn't happy with the Playgrounds beta for Swift Data, uh, so it's and it's not easy to play with Playgrounds with this. As of now, uh, I may end up, which is what I did with uh, with the Swift UI course, is I may end up putting demo files about the about the real course with uh, from Xcode side uh, as playground files further down the line once I finish the course. So it's still possible to play with playgrounds. I mean, it's I haven't really worked on stuff. I look at playgrounds as though it's my favorite prototyping environment. Mm hmm. So if I want to make a, but I can call them software toys. If you want to make a software toy, that's what I do in Playground. So if I need something really dirty, quick and dirty, I'll do it there. I almost always have my iPad on me. So I can quickly come up with a little thing, see if it works. If I don't remember how, you know, some method works, I'll I'll play with it on that one. I mean, that's where I use Playgrounds. And that's where I think Playgrounds could be used by more professional developers compared to learners. And so... That's where I tend to use it. That's where I tend to champion it, even though Apple gets wishy-washy about whether they think that's the audience or not. Uh, I mean, and that's one of the things that's always been a problem with Playgrounds is they, they've they never actually figured out what they want to do with it. Right. So we can go to a couple of, couple of threads there, but like one of them, I guess, is, is so the promise was, I guess, two years ago when they added the app ability into playgrounds like you can you can create an app in playgrounds and you can start from there and and, and i did i did follow your your linkedin course on that um where do you think that is like do you think it is really viable that somebody builds a, a full app on or yeah full app on ipad on playgrounds i could see people doing it i 
I think it would be a, a relatively simple app. It would not be something complex per se. I mean, mm -hmm. there are things you can do that there on, on playgrounds, which I actually would do more often on playgrounds than I would actually on Xcode. It, you always got to remember with playgrounds because it's an, and I'm talking particularly about the iPad playgrounds right. here. When right. I'm talking about yeah. it. When you're talking about the iPad playgrounds, you don't have a simulator per se. I mean, you've got the preview, but you don't have a simulator. You're using real devices. You know, you're you're if you're using MapKit or you're using any of the AR stuff or anything like that, you're using cameras, you're using the actual locations. Right. And it's running at full speed. Right. So it's not it's not like the simulator which is which is Right. Could be built, could be running on Intel as opposed to right. Apple Silicon. Here you're purely in Apple Silicon land, and right. Um, so so if you're if you're in Playground, let's let's imagine this. So I'm sitting in front of my iPad. Obviously, I'm sitting in front of my iPad because it can only run Playgrounds on a Mac or iPad, not not mm -hmm. a phone, right? So if right. I'm emulate if I'm writing a phone app and I go to run the preview, I think it's I forget what the command is, but you run that. Pre do you get like an iPhone kind of window to to play around with, or how does that work? For preview, your standard size window on a iPad, mm -hmm. the standard size window is about phone shaped. Okay. So yes, you can like leave black it like, bars on both sides, kind of thing. Yeah, or it's okay. it doesn't have the black bars, but if you just use the default settings, which is I think a one third of essentially of the of the screen, if you leave it like that, it's pretty close to a iPhone. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember, and I think it's in my course, but I, I don't remember off the top of my head. But I don't remember how the environment variables look at it to say, I think it actually does say that it's compact at that right. point. Right, okay, right. So it does have a compact width for the size class, so it thinks of it as a phone. Right. If you hit run, it's going to go full iPad. If you extend that over, that preview, it'll get big enough that it'll actually start acting like a like a actual device now can i don't you, remember i i can't guarantee that because I, I sometimes get confused with it and they keep switching it on me yeah so i i'm that i that i will hedge my bet on that but I, that's how i sort of remember it I and some it. of the edge case things like like can you like i guess can you do it i'm i'm guessing you can't really emulate like dynamic island or live activities that kind of thing can you get those no, things going no no you can't get those yet so that's what you're talking about some of the complexity like right Core data was always a challenge, yeah. Some of the core libraries, right? Yeah, core data is a problem for other reasons. Uh, the core data's big problem is you got to set up the the, uh, the store the model properly. Yeah. So that becomes a problem unless you really know what you're doing for doing it, dealing with previews. Okay. Because you've essentially got to make your whole database for the preview for it to work right. And that, that takes a little bit more code than most people are going to first know at first. It's not as simple as, as doing that. Yeah, I don't want to be too dismissive of uh, developing on Playgrounds because, I mean, I think it's really fantastic that you can do yeah. that. I mean, like, I kind of wonder if there is a, a developer or, or a community out there that would look at... Because Xcode, Xcode can be a pain in the butt. I mean, it's sort of the... Mm -hmm. it's the it's the the drunk uncle we all work with, right? Right. You know, <laughs> so it has a lot, there's a lot of uh, things in it. It gets better. I mean, like like a lot of the stuff I've been doing with Swift Data lately, I mean, I I recently refactored an app. I started in Core Data with Swift UI, got mm -hmm. lost in the mire of MVVM and all that kind of, you know, bad advice that we got back a couple of years ago. Um, and I just recently went, I started studying Swift Data a bit, you know, some of the courses online and that kind of stuff. And then I thought, well, what the heck, let's refactor this core data app. Once I realized that, you know, the data store is the same, the actual, the mom files and the, right. the, the, the SQL stuff in, is, is in a location. You can name that location. You can set up configuration. Mm -hmm. You can go in there. And I sort of uncovered that one of the challenges I have about refactoring is like, am I using the same data? Like, you know, I've already invested a little bit of energy, not 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 that I can't throw out, but energy in creating records and and creating a model and working with different metaphors for for what my business logic is. And then what I was able to do was just take the Swift data and re like set up the models in Swift data and then point to the same store and then get that mm -hmm. same those same assets. So I've got I'm working I'm just about to work I'm working on a release right now for an app that um and you know I've talked about this offline, but uh. I'm using this, I'm, I've got records in there that I created in 20, 2021, you know, that I'm 
Yeah. I'm just, I, I don't want to let, like, you know, you say I got a lot of junk behind me. I don't want to leave that junk behind, you know, and oh, go yeah. into a greenfield application. I want to basically say, okay, well, this is what I can do. And, and I'm, I'm amazed that I, in the last two weeks, I've done more, have made more progress than I did in three years working core data at Swift UI and MVVM. So, I mean, the, yes. the iOS 17 stuff for, for Swift data is amazing, right? It is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the fact that, you know, I mean, if you figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, the beauty of the beauty of the Swift data announcement was that uh, was it this year or last year? I can't remember this year, this year. Yeah. The, the, I mean, everybody wanted a new core data. Everybody wanted a non core data like core data because core data has some fugly parts to it. Right. Because it, it comes over from the older style of development in iOS. I mean, it started what in tiger and, and, uh, uh iOS 10, maybe 10.4 anyway of, of the Mac. Right. So it's been around for a while, but, and, and it's, it's, you know, people have abandoned it and gone to realm and they've gone to other, you know, Firebase and things like that. And now people are coming back to it. I think with Swift data, we've got the, we want the Swift UI version of it. Right. And I'm actually surprised at how much core data actually is under the hood. Right. I think maybe you can yeah. talk to some of that. There, there it's there. I mean, you, you can start seeing it um, as, as you were pointing out the files, when you get down to the, the SQLite levels, those are the same files. There are some utilities that you can use for core data to work fine for for Swift data, and you can start seeing that seeing those those tables if you need to. Um, yeah, it's it's great in those respects. There are times when you see it. I think one of the big things you can see it the most in is is with codable. Is virtually everything has to be codable. And it's it's using Codable as its straitjacket to make sure that it can get down to core data. And a lot of the times what I've been seeing with the model side of things is the Codable protocol, and, and it's changed in a couple of versions where things have actually started shifting better. The Codable protocol is an even bigger straitjacket than it normally is for, say, if you're doing a JSON or JSON mm -hmm. um, file. So... Those are those are also going on, and I think that that's where you see it the most is when you're trying to push this thing down. Many of the commands, one of the methods that you're using on the model containers and the model contexts uh, look very similar to what you what you can see in core data, mm -hmm. and so those look similar. So, what kind of journey are you going to take an engineer or, or developer who wants to learn this stuff? I mean. And again, you're saying you're starting from someone who has no preconceived right, right. So what baggage like I do, right? <laughs> right. I mean, I spend on my other side of my professional life when I'm not doing iOS stuff, I spend a huge chunk of that with SQL. So I have this data so database mindset to begin with. Um, and although it's not really a database and there's lots of things you could do with core data or Swift data that would make uh, transact SQL absolutely upset. I was going to use other words, but I'll use mm. those. Mm -hmm. um, it's good to start to think that way, because that's something that, that most people have some idea about how to look at it as a database. So what I do is we have a menu program, a menu app that's already built that has no persistence. And we're going to build the persistence into it with three pieces. I will demonstrate it with how to put together ratings for pizzas. And so you, you'll you see me do this first on the most simple flat file type situation. Right. So you just get the basic basic parts of um, inserting a record, deleting a record, right. you know, displaying a record. Then we go one step further and start looking at how to sort that information and how to filter that information. Then from there, we go into the, the, the idea of what I just said with Codable is that once you start getting away from simple strings and simple integers and doubles, life gets a little more complicated. Mm -hmm. And how do you deal with that more complicated life in terms of using, another, start to see one to many relationships, maybe one that isn't actually a persistent one, but might be some kind of constant or something like that. And then build from that into a one-to-many relationship when we build an actual ordering app where you have a header and a bunch of lines of detail. Right. Cool. I mean, one of the one of the nice things about Swift Data I find is is the sort of the way that uh, predicates are handled in terms of yes. filtering, right? 
um, you know, that was the part I was talking about with core data. It, it, like it, as Frank Zappa would say, it, it had eyebrows, right? Because yeah. it had this weird sort of, you know, strange language. I don't want to insult any 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 races particularly, but it, it sort of had that, you know, it was like a different, it was like a foreign language, right? It was, you yeah. know, in terms of how you, and it was, and it looked very archaic, right? Um, and that, I think that, I mean, to me, that was a blocker for me in terms of like really understanding yeah. or getting my head around predicates, but they seem to be a lot nicer now um, in that they've, they've sort of softened that language, right? I think, and I do it. I mean, the first of that chapter is I go back to arrays and go through map, filter, and first. If you can handle map, filter, and first, you can handle predicates in Swift data. Right, it's right. Yeah. almost the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's cool. Um, I'm really like I really that was a uh, I think that's again part of the part of the reason why uh, I've been able to get so much more done. Yes, on this side, not having to sort of really get my head wrapped around those. I don't even know what what you call it. it look, what kind of language structure it is, but it's a very strange. It was a very strange yeah. way of of de- naming a, a predicate and understanding I, it. Right. I've heard many people curse them. So yes, <laughs> it, it's been my. I, I'll be perfectly honest. I really don't know core data. Hmm. That was a big, huge part of my entry barrier. But you have you've got a, a good founding, and like you said, from other other work right. databases so, in general, I mean, right? So other databases. So it's not. I'm I'm taking it from that side of it, which gives me, I think, a perspective that's going to make it easier for people who have never touched core data before. Right. Cool. And so coming back to the Huli, Huli Pizza thing. So I, I've you know I've gone through your courses before. So I'm the owner of Huli Pizza. I've got the the ordering system on the phone, so you know customers can come in. They can mark their favorite pizza. They can choose. I forget which one. Obviously, we have a messed up Hawaiian in there, and and I think yep. there's some other margarita pizza. I think is another style you have in there. Right. So now that so now I'm a, a a patron coming in, sitting at the restaurant. You're handing me an iPad. That's the the app we're making. Is I go through and I make yes. my wine selection and I choose my pizza right. from there. Right. Yep. I've actually known there's restaurants here that actually do that, um, where they have uh, an iPad sitting in front of you on the counter and you order. I mean, mm. there's a couple of the of the of the sushi places around here. You order your sushi on there, and they actually have little trains that come by to uh, to, to deliver, deliver sushi. So you don't actually see the servers. You put your your order in, and then it just stops right at your at your table. I'm not going that far, but uh, but. Yeah, it's that kind of app, and I've seen several people who do things like that where you have this kind of thing. So, yeah, what you'll do is you'll have a bunch of different pizzas. Uh, the story is about four friends who were surfers, and after they went surfing, they ended up uh, making their own pizzas. And so they have both classical pizzas like the margarita or and a quattro formaggi and things like that. And then they also have things that they took from street food, like the Huli pizza itself the huli chicken pizza um a couple of really weird ones which i i call the 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 musubi pizzas there's a spam and a veggie musubi pizza which is actually based i i haven't made taken a picture of it most of them have photos those are the two that don't have photos it's actually based on a very popular chef here in hawaii who who made an interesting crust on a seafood dish that i had and i still have not totally replicated it but i know what it is so it's actually a crisp it's almost like a rice crispy it's a savory rice crispy with toppings on top of it instead of a pizza crust. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean, my foodie side, because I spent, before I was doing iOS stuff, I was a health inspector for five-star restaurants. Oh, really? Okay. I, I, I spent a lot of time around some, re- I've, I think there are eight James Beard award winning chefs that I've worked with over over the 15 years I was a health inspector. Hmm. So I, I, I ended up in that mindset, too, that I had to think like them. And so I actually sometimes think like a chef and say, okay, we could do this. <laughs> <laughs> cool. A couple of really weird ones. That's kind of a good segue because I always like to sort of go to the, you know, this is part of a journey, obviously, but how did you get to where you are today? Like, did you, let's go way back in, in terms of like computer science or just computers okay. or games or how did, how did you go from little Steve, I guess in Ohio, I think, right? Um, Chicago. Chicago. Started, yeah. To, to Honolulu, where you are today. Okay. Well, um, actually, I think I'd go back. Yeah, probably 11 is probably the best age to start. Um, <laughs> okay. We had just moved to Chicago. We had lived in, we lived in Cumberland, Maryland for uh, two years. And, and my dad did not, his job didn't work out there. So we moved to Chicago. 
and I was interested in high tech stuff. I was already in reading science fiction. I thought it was really cool. I was in a high tech stuff. Uh, it was really easy to get electronics magazines where they talk about all these integrated circuits and stuff like that. So I bought one of those and then I bought a little kit from Radio Shack and put it together with a soldering iron and then melted this IC. <laughs> in there. Uh, yep. <laughs> and, and it was just, I was so devastated. You know, 11 year old me, it was totally. Um, devastated and then so the next time i went to the the store to buy a, a magazine i saw this magazine called creative computing mm. um and i bought an issue and i was hooked and there was just all this code and in those days your entire source code was written on two pages of magazine right yeah, yeah usually basic and you would sit there and you I, I would just pour through those magazines what was your first computer well and i was getting to that so okay. about a year and a half later uh, I s saved up my money and I bought a TRS-80 Model 1 4K oh, cool, yeah. mm -hmm. with the cassette. Right. Uh, so, yeah, you could load everything with the cassette. It was great. Um, hmm. From there, I went to uh, an Apple II Plus and developed on the Apple II Plus. My parents had started the small business because they realized that both myself and my sister were going to need a lot of money to get through college. Right. And, which they didn't have. So they started a side gig. Um, and as part of that side gig, what they're going to, what they needed to do, uh, was have some kind of accounting system. Mm, okay. So one of my first applications that I wrote was the accounts receivable side, uh, which would, uh, put the order in and output an invoice that the way we could then send out the, the shipments. Um, so yeah, it was my first, my first major program was that I then, as part of what we were doing, which worked on microscope slides, one inch by three inch pieces of glass, we did a one inch by one inch label to say what we were selling. So I wrote a program for that. It was so cool. That was my first published app for all intents and purposes. We put that in the catalog. So, uh, so on your sure. profile, on your LinkedIn profile, you've got the scientific, I forget what the name of the right, company is. Device. Is that is that this company yes. we're talking about? Oh, this, cool. This is this company. Uh, it started my dad and his partner, who was a, uh, they were both uh, cl uh, microbiology supervisors that are prospective hospitals. Uh, they started each with $500, uh, and we've grown to have sales of, of several million dollars now. So, I mean, it's grown a lot, and wow. it has been a huge evolution. So what ended up happening was I got into that. Um, that was the first program I sold. Went to college. Um, as I was Going through college, I had a few summer jobs at a software uh, retailer when it used to be that you could actually have a store that had actual boxes. With a box and a disc in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you had a box on the wall, most of them saying Infocom on them. Yeah. Um, and, um, or Microsoft. There's a lot of Microsoft ones there, too. And I found out I really like training. So what ended up happening was after I went through school, I realized as I was doing all this programming work, I am not the kind of person who wants to sit at his desk coding every day. Right. Okay. Uh, I am more happy. I'm happier when I'm interacting with the users. And uh, so I ended up thinking, okay, maybe I'd be better as a trainer. So I ended up with a training job for actually, again, an accounts receivable system and for medical, for medical offices. I survived that first job for about a year and a half uh, before I burnt out. It had a, six day travel schedule mm -hmm. uh, so i was anywhere between omaha and pittsburgh every day from monday well actually from sunday night to probably saturday morning or friday night so is this driving every day or staying in hotels it was either, and... i was dry it was either drive it depended where it was it was either driving staying in hotels flying or some combination of all of those and i was bouncing i was bouncing around an awful lot of the country for for quite a while and I burnt out with that. So I took another job like it at a smaller accounting firm. Uh, that division folded, and I bailed just before it folded. Um, went to another company, worked for them for a little while, and that wasn't as as much fun. I guess I'd call it that. Uh, so the politics of this last one, which is why it wasn't fun, ended up biting me in the butt, and I found myself without a job again. At the same time... Like I said, my dad's in microbiology. He was working in a hospital. A friend of a friend knew a chef, and the chef had a real problem. And the problem was they had an outbreak of some foodborne illness that had affected um, 
I think it was 30 people. It was a big, big one. It was on the news. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a high profile restaurant and everyone was panicking. Right. So we, so this friend of a friend asked my dad to look into it. And my dad looked into it and actually figured out what it was before the okay. health department did. The health department loved him because he actually solved their problem without them having to do anything. Right. Okay. Um, and once all that happened, the company that, Oh, that the chef worked for said, do you consult? And he says, sure, why not? <laughs> yeah, of course I do. Yeah. And so he started a consulting firm. And so that was about a year and a half before the last job, the, the last uh, of those support jobs with the AR system. So I had nothing else better to do. So he said, hey, why don't you teach the courses that are mandated by the state and do all the consulting on that? And I said, okay. So okay. I spent... 15 years essentially working with um, high-end restaurants, making sure they were doing things right according to both the law and according to the chefs. Because I was, of course, since I'm essentially industry, I have to look at both, both sides of the equation. I mean, a health inspector comes in and says, no, you can't do that. I walk in and says, I know you can't do that by the law, but let's see if we can figure out a way that you can do it. And coming up with interesting solutions. And I worked in everything from five-star restaurants to stadiums to a, a few golf tournaments and all kinds of stuff in between uh, of doing all that kind of stuff to keep them safe. And so I spent a lot of time in health. That came to an end, um, mostly because the dot-com bubble burst and people's budgets changed. Um, so I was stuck with not anything there. I went back into spending more IT time on scientific advice and about years into that, I met my wife again, which is mm -hmm. another whole long story. But okay. uh, yeah. it was it's a it's a sleepless in Seattle romantic comedy story that I won't go into. But um, I met my wife. I got married. I needed more income, and so I said, "Hey, you know, everyone's making all these apps. Maybe I could do that." So I started with uh, learning Objective C. Uh, hit a huge brick wall with delegates. This on the Mac or. It was, it's actually, yeah, I started, I was actually starting on, on in, in, uh, for iPhone, but I was actually just okay. playing with Xcode just to get it to work on an iPhone. I, I don't remember. Probably, uh, it was probably iOS 10. Okay. Let's see. When yeah. was this? This would have been, this would have been 2011. Okay. All so, right. Yeah. So that'd be about right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I started playing with that. Took a huge amount of time. I think, I, I, I don't know if every, I, from what I got from my course, it is a brick wall for a lot of people We're trying to figure out how it, how a delegate works. Um, so yeah, I took me six months to say, I, it just was, not, it was so counterintuitive from what I had learned from before any, I think object oriented. Uh, but I actually put out an app and it did do really well. Big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Big surprise. No helicopter uh, money. No. Okay. No helicopter money. No. And, and so I tried another one and that didn't do too well. I tried one more and that didn't do well. And then I decided, Hey, let's try it. And then someone dared me because I, I don't know if anyone, if you remember Flappy Bird. Yes. Yeah. I made a, I made a couple of those. I, taught, I was teaching at the time. And I taught people how to make the Flappy Bird app. Yeah. I mean, that was exactly the point is, uh, you know, Sprite Kid had just come out and, uh, I was talking to a friend and I said, this thing is so stupid. You know, I could write this in a week. Right. Yeah. And so she dared me. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> so Slippy Flippy Penguin was born. Uh, mm -hmm. And I did that. I decided I was going to try to do the same thing he did and use an ad revenue thing, which I think my total sale, my total revenue is four cents. Right. Uh, <laughs> that didn't yeah. work really well either. Well, ironically, I call my app business pizza money because that's pretty much what I get. I, yeah, I, 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 for a get. while there, I was getting enough money to buy pizza. It's a lot less now, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, it's not – there's that whole side of the app store that nobody talks about. Yeah. Um. So I've been doing – I was been doing back and forth with that. I said, maybe I should look at a different language. And so I started looking at Python and mm -hmm. started blogging about Python. And I had created a blog called Make App Pi. Right, okay, right. Uh, and I was talking about Python on Raspberry Pis. Oh, okay. Was what the whole thing was about. So I was doing that for about four months, and then WWDC happened, and I watched everyone's jaw drop when they said, hey, we got a new language. It's called Swift. <laughs> and everybody's jaw dropped because they had absolutely no idea what to do. 
Well, if you've looked at a little bit of Python or Ruby or some of the mm-hmm. other things that you're there, guess what? They look an awful lot alike. It's, it's, it's the classic Apple steal from everybody else the good stuff and make a new, some, new something right. with it. Right, yeah. And, and that's Swift. And I was able to do a transition really fast from what I was doing, and I made makeapppie.com a Swift language tutorial. And so very rapidly, people started looking for stuff, and it really hit its stride. I did five tutorials, and then I did one on UI table view. And it just, that just shot out of no, out of the sky. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, and just because no one could figure out how to do a UI table view in Swift. Really? Okay. At, at the time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. No, I, yeah. Like, yeah, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I get it. I get it. I mean, everyone was so objective C, which is, you know, mm-mm, compared to, uh, uh, you know, so asked backwards compared to Swift, because Swift is starting to look like, you know, everybody else's language. Right. Yep. Um, that. People were having a hard time making that change. And so that one thing then chumped me up. That changed the SEO and everything else started going. Mm, So about a year after that, I'm, you know, I'm sitting here for a lot of the, you know, between me, uh, Erica Sadoon, Natasha the Robot. I mean, there was a bunch, there's like five or six people who were constantly doing the Swift stuff. And those were the top four whenever you did a Google search. And I was in there. So I was constantly in those, those top four or five that were coming out. Uh, at that at that time, and so I kept getting this stuff. So one day, a Lynda dot com uh, rep rep content manager saw my articles and said, "Hey, do you want to do a do you want to do a video?" I go, "Oh, cool, yeah, <laughs> be fun. sure, yeah." So I go ahead and I do a video for them, and I I they say, "Okay, here's what we can do, and here's once you propose something." So look at the what what would you like to do? I said, "I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this." Um, and the one they picked on was um, was Watch OS. Oh, okay. Um, I forget the guy's name that I'm following because someone had done it, and he did such a great job. Uh, mm-hmm. Not Simon Allardyce. Simon. Yep, that's who. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was Simon. So Simon had done it, and so I'm now following Simon, which was enough of a. Yeah, he's a, he's a good guy. <laughs> he's incredible. Um, so I, I was a little intimidated, but I went through it. And it did okay. So I said, can I do another one? And so I did another one, which was also, I think, on watch. And then I said, you know, I've had all these problems with delegates. Why don't I do one on delegates? I said, okay. And so I did one on delegates. And I kept doing them. And I'm now, and then shortly after that, I said, hey, do you want to do a weekly? Right. Oh, really? Okay. And so I did iOS development t- tips weekly. And so on LinkedIn Learning, there's a, I think it's like eight hours worth of tips that are still sitting out there. Yeah, I saw them uh, on your website so, today, actually, yeah. So I've got all of those uh, out there. And then from there, I I started doing more stuff. Same time at my regular job, I was doing more. I was some uh, shifting of both family dynamics and corporate dynamics put me in a different position where I was now controlling almost everything that had to do with the SAP software that was running the business. So I became an expert on that, and so I asked LinkedIn if they wanted me to do something with that, and it just so happened they didn't have anybody doing that particular product. I said, sure. And so I did five videos of that, which took me up into – well, actually, it took me two videos of that, which takes us up to COVID, and then I spent most of COVID just creating content. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you were lucky in that sense that you, you didn't – you know, you could do that from remote as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think actually, I... I did it on – no, well, no, that's actually not. It's almost the same focus right that I did that I did. The, <laughs> yeah, I can't. Here. I can't remember how I first. Found, I know I, I've I've seen you speak at 360 iDev uh, a few times or once or twice, but um, I can't remember how I sort of stumbled across you. Maybe because I was looking at playgrounds or something last year. Probably. Uh, yeah. So because because I, mean, I have a friend who works on the playgrounds team at at Apple. We haven't really been in touch since he joined Apple, of course, but. Um, yeah, they're just like, you know, fascinated by the work that they're doing over there. And it, and it's an interesting thing. I think that, um, when it came out, it was kind of like, it, I think they approached it from a sort of an educational point of view yeah. as a tool for that. And then they, they put it out there as sort of a, a scratch pad for Xcode, as you said. Right. Um, and now, you know, there, there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of under the hood stuff you can do in Xcode on the Mac that you really can't do on the iPad because you don't have good access to the file system. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, so even, I think there was a, there was a, uh, you know, building books and creating links from one page to the other, right. that kind of stuff is, was all sort of possible in there as well. So 
It's kind of an interesting thing. Cool. So, so, so you're basically a serial educator now, I guess, right? Yes, I'm a serial educator. <laughs> <laughs> a serial me. trainer. Yeah, it's funny. I, I I did it. I did training all through my early career before before development. Um, yeah, I did similar things where I would sit. So, were you sitting next to somebody and training them, or were you like at the front of a class with like five or six students? Or when I was the... doing tra- in the early days, um, for for most of the training that I've done, I've done both stand up. So in in the very early days when I was doing the AR system, it was a stand up course which would introduce them to the product. Uh, again. People I'm dealing with, if you want to talk about users, is people who had never dealt with a computer before. These were the most of these were again. It's it's the Midwest. It was a lot of small Midwestern towns. It was doctors' offices where their mom, where the doctor's mom was probably the office manager. Uh, uh, we had people who just thought the computers were going to just explode and if they pushed the wrong button. Uh, I mean, I had I actually banged around keyboards. I had one extra keyboard just. I didn't want to totally destroy it, where I would bang the keyboard against the wall <laughs> so they could see it's not going to break. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, right. I, had to, I had to do things like that. Um, yeah. So there was this stand-up training for that site, but then after that, I'd go on site, which is why all the travel. Right. I'd go on site and then sit with them and go step-by-step step of how to put in patients. Yeah, set it up. Or, and, yeah. And then yeah. how to, you know, put their diagnosis in there and how to deal with Medicare in this particular state versus Medicare in that particular state. Right, right. Yeah, it's funny that that kind of that kind of business line. I think I don't know if that business line kind of still exists because now there's so much accessible information online. You know, with courses and tools. You know, we used to have to like I think you'd have to go back in and and sort of help them set up the system that they're going to use right. as an SAP, as you mentioned, right? So I mean, I, I I see a lot of the a lot of that does online is they'll do Zoom things like that. The people that I interface with from from the SAP providers, they'll tend to interface with me that way. Again, I already know it, so it's not the same thing. Uh, when we had the initial installs, I think it's still a good thing to have people on site who totally understand the system. Uh, I, I have a problem. I, my wife is dealing with this now with, with a system. Uh, I think many times people assume things are going to be like you know an iOS app where everything will be easy to look at. And there's only really one workflow, but in the real world, in the business world, and particularly in medicine, uh, there are infinite number of workflows and you've got to be able to understand adapt, yeah. that yeah. that customer and adapt. So I like to talk, I just like to ask people like on this show um, about where the puck is going. Where, where do you think, where do you think we are in terms of where Apple is with their devices and their softwares? And where do you think we're going? I mean, maybe even if you have some thoughts on vision Vision Pro and Vision OS. Well, uh, well, there's the elephant in the room, which, which is which Apple is very nicely calling machine learning. Yeah, keep away okay. From that other term, which um, which there's a lot of hype around that. Uh, I have lots of issues with that myself. I, I'm a little I'm a little nervous about AI from perspectives which I I, I don't think other people have actually looked at very carefully. Um, one of the apps that I use for my writing, uh, IA Writer just did a great series of articles about this is from the app development side, we only have like two or three engines out there. If you want to call them engines to deal with AI at the moment for machine uh, MMLs, Um, they're going to scrape your data in order to work. Essentially they're going to assimilate your app. They don't need you anymore once you're adopted their app. So we actually run a danger as app developers of giving away all our secrets or giving away our code to someone just to add what may be just a shiny feature. And I, I that's one of many, I mean, there's lots of different things and you can go online and see all the different objections. But it's one of the ones that I've been looking at very carefully is where, you know, where are you, because these things have to use huge databases. I, I, I actually call, I mean, and it's even now so more so with how much Microsoft is, uh, even more invested in open AI is it's clippy with clippy with a large database. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what it is. And if you look at it in that respect, it's it, you see it differently than thinking it's some super intelligent thing. It isn't, it's clippy. It's the same. clippy. It's, a, it's, it's, just, a, it's an automated fact. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a, it's just, it's clippy with a lot more data that he can then randomly pull. Um, and sometimes just as annoying. Um, so, I mean, I see that. I think there are things out there that work really well. 
I mean, I, I look at Grammarly as an example of an application that, that's using it in, in a good sense. I'm a little nervous because, you know, that's taking my information to do it. And so it is scraping my information in order to work. So, you know, you, you do have to worry about that. Um, but there are things that are working well. The machine learning side, you know, but some of the things that we can look at with Apple is, you know, that I love the automatic clipping that you can do with a photo is that you just tap on an object yeah. in a photo and just drag it. And then you've got, you've, it's already clipped for you. Right. Uh, I mean, that kind of stuff's cool. That kind of stuff makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so where it's, where that's going to go is going to be very interesting. And I think there's going to be another uh, bubble and bust before anything really useful comes out of it. Uh, I'm also like, like you said, vision OS is something I am very intrigued with. Mm -hmm. Uh, for my own use, I mean, I live here, right. but I work in the middle there. of the United States, uh, in the middle of the mainland. So that means 10 hours plus of travel every time I go from point A to point B. I can see that if I had six screens that I could sit back in my airline seat and work, <laughs> yeah. that could be really nice for me. Uh, and I, could, I, I don't necessarily get it. I'm not a gamer for lots of reasons, but I, I, I'm not a gamer. I, those kinds of things don't be it. Maybe a huge cinematic movie would be really cool, but I could see it, you know, I could see it that if I had six screens instead of two, I mean, I've got three, I got three iPads and two screens right here. Mm -hmm. and, Same here. You know, I, 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 I use that much just to keep myself organized and productive. If I had that easily, to, it's worth it. Oh yeah. And yeah. hundred percent. I, I think, I think, where we're going to see stuff is is not necessarily augmented reality type stuff as much as being able to build environments where you have enough information around you of multiple windows. It's not going to be windows piled on top of each other. We have the the, the very simple two and a half D of Microsoft Windows or Mac OS. What we need is that we can look around the room and see everything yeah, put something over here and come back to it later come exactly over here, over here or actually just be in your swivel chair and turn around and yeah. have you know 20 things running around you that that would be where i think it's going to be productive is that and you can stick your fingers out and type wherever you are i mean that that kind of stuff is where i see it and i, I think it's a the way apple is approaching it just like i said earlier their their favorite thing to do is steal from everybody else yeah and then make it better yeah i call it leading from behind Leading from behind, exactly. And I think that's what they're doing with this, too. And they're taking their time, and they're being very careful um, about how they do it. So they, they're not they're, they're not fools who rush in. As much as analysts love to complain that they don't rush in, and, you know, oh, no, uh, Apple doesn't have a foldable foldable phone. Well, no one else has now. a successful, <laughs> no else has a successful <laughs> foldable phone anyway. Yeah, yeah, and the best of the bad luck, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I mean, I think about when I think about the the, the promise of my, I've changed my opinion over. If you listen to the show, you know, I've changed my opinion over the the Vision OS over the over the months. But especially after having gone and tried it out myself, um, I mean, there are businesses that didn't exist before the iPhone. There are, right. you know, uh, you know, access to information we didn't have before the internet came along. Right. So you and I both experienced that. Right. And. I, I definitely think that the Vision OS or, or spatial computing, let's call it that, right? Because I'm sure Google's working on something and Microsoft working yeah. on something. And everybody's brothers work. If you don't think they are, you're fooling yourself. Um, I think that there's going to be businesses coming out of this that we're not even aware of. And who knows? Maybe it, maybe it is that we don't go back to the office because we can now bring the office to us, right? Or like you said, right. I mean, I, I think I told you the other, the, a couple of days ago that when I fly on my on a plane, I often take my wife's 11 inch MacBook Air because it's the only one I can open in economy. You know, right. whereas now if I can have my Vision OS headset on with my big, you know, extra battery pack from Amazon, um, I can sit on the or plug it into the USB port on the plane. I can sit there and I can, you know, like you said, work on or or consume information or watch an IMAX movie while I'm in the plane on my five hour flight or in your case, mm -hmm. six hour flight. You know. Um, you know, so, so I mean, and like Uber didn't exist, Twitter didn't exist, you know, DoorDash didn't exist, you know, who knows what kind of Instacart didn't exist, you know, Amazon existed, but it lives, it's much nicer now on the iPhone than it was on a web oh, browser, yeah. 
Although they led the way in web browsers. I mean, remember, remember the indexes across the top. And I mean, they were they were the site to look at in terms of who was leading the pack back in the day. But, uh, you know, in the Don't Make Me Think book, he uses he uses uh, Amazon's web page as a, as a perfect analogy of how to organize data. Right. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think that it holds a lot of promise for, for where we were, we're going to go with this. So, yeah, interesting to see. I just wanted to add one more thing. I think yeah, there sure. are some companies that are going to definitely pull out the stops on that. Uh, I think, you know, we're going to see, I, it'd be very interesting to see, for example, what ends up happening with Final Cut Pro and 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 this. That would be one thing I want to see. Or or Autodesk. Um, or eventually, I pro- Procreate. Or Xcode. Although I don't know, I, I, or Xcode. I, or I just see people doing this, yeah, but... Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> With procreating, you know, I was like swiping their hands all well, over and hitting people. But you know, I'm also I'm also a visual artist by training, and I've done sculpture, and I've done 3D. I, I was I, I've told this story before, but I was learning to do sculpture on my iPad because I've got 3D printers right here, and I print out stuff. Right. And you know, so I, I learned. I don't know where the heck somewhere over there. There's there's a portrait of me. Oh, it's up there. Um, that I made. I let me just grab this. All right. So this is a. Self portrait that I made. Let's get the light right. <laughs> That's a self portrait yep. that I made. I did the sculpture itself because I can sculpt in real life, but I sculpted on my iPad with a pencil. I found yeah. a course on how to how to model, you know, a human face, and I printed it out on my 3D printer. So I've taken something that I built virtually and put it in the three real world. I did. Right. I regret that I didn't take the model with me to the Vision Pro. It would have been cool to see that on on in reality. Uh, camera, yeah. Right? <laughs> But, um, you know, so that, I mean, like, that's something that didn't exist until a few years ago, right? To be able to, be able to do that. So I think it, it could be, if, and just going in exactly that, I think it could be a resurgence of 3D printers and people are going to really start and painting and, and painting yeah. and, and, you know, and some of the actual hardware that are going along with it is that if you can get the, the 3D printer files made there and then crap like this somewhere and end up sending it to the printer, that, I mean, that's going to, that's going to change things. Yeah, it's going to change the whole the, the big big change in looking for laser writer. Which I don't know if you get that if you're an Mac guy from way back when. <laughs> oh yeah, looking for laser. It's over there. That's where it is. You're looking for it. Aye, aye. Anyway, I, I want to get to a, an interesting part of the show that we do. Um, okay. Which, which is sort of the Tim's questions, and it's based on uh, the work of Marcel Proust. I don't know if you know the Marcel Proust questionnaire. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've also stolen a bunch of questions from Stephen Colbert to make it more fun, right? So. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're seated comfortably, we can we can delve into this part of the show. Okay, Se- seated comfortably. Simple one is: What's your motto? What's your what's the elevator pitch for Steve Lipton? Let's do something stupid next. Oh, cool. All right. Um, and would you like to expound on that, or just sure, sure? I mean, you know, I it's first of all one of the best ways to get past imposter syndrome is just assume you're going to be doing something foolish or stupid. Right. Okay. Uh, so it 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 it, you, it just you go buzz right past it. Um, but it's also that's how you discover things. Is it's all in that stuff where you're going to be at the bottom and work your way up. I mean, I, we've been talking about Swift Data. I started at the bottom. It this one was a slog to say the least. Uh, and it didn't help much that Apple kept changing the goalposts every day. Yeah. But uh, it was a slog. But it, it's worth it in the end. And you, you go through those slogs and you just know, okay, I, I'm not doing this. I'm not getting, I don't feel good about it right now, but eventually it, it will happen. And I've done that in so many different things where I'd say, okay, let's do, I mean, running. I mean, I never expected myself ever to run a marathon. And I, one day I said, okay, let's start. Let's, I need to get some exercise. So let me start running. And so I ran a little bit and a little bit. And then I ended up doing 5Ks and 10Ks and half marathons. And then I came up with the idea, hey, let's do the, let's do the Disney marathon. And so I ended up doing the Disney marathon. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, who are your heroes in real life? I think the first one's actually my dad. Okay. Uh, and I've already talked about it. I mean, to someone who took, um, he's, he's a brilliant guy to begin with, but uh, someone who took, you know, a thousand bucks. And can turn it into many years later several million dollars mm. uh, in sales is quite amazing. And I think a lot of how I think about stuff and how I look at stuff comes from him. Uh, and he's come up with some really brilliant ideas. I mean, one of the first inventions that came out of uh, Scientific Device that, besides our standard stuff that we sell now, is a product that doesn't exist anymore called the slide dryer. And there's a problem in hospital laboratories that you have to 
take a sample, and then you have to dry it so that it's fixed on the slide. The traditional way of doing this is taking your fingers, putting it over a Bunsen burner, and trying not to burn your fingers, which isn't very safe. Right. Now, yeah. there's another device that's there, which is an electric incinerator that's about this big. It's a tube about this big with a tiny hole in it that you use to make inoculation loop, to sterilize inoculation loops in the lab. That gives off a ton of waste heat. So we put an aluminum plate on top of this incinerator, which generated enough heat just by conducting it off the waste heat to dry those slides. Mm, okay. And it's a genius, simple solution. And he did such a brilliant thing with doing it. Uh, that's my favorite example of, I mean, he's done others. I mean, some of them are actually insanely, uh, successful. Um, unfortunately I can't, there's NDAs involved with those. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who they are. We'll, we'll take but, your word I mean, for it. There, yeah. But, but there, there are some that actually, if you look in the literature, it is the product he came up with that they talk about as the standard. Oh, wow. Cool. cool. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's how. It goes, and that's and that's why I would pick him as as for that. Okay, so what's your favorite word? Actually, it's it's three words. Okay, and it's actually the three words that I, I was thinking about when I started to say it. I don't know. <laughs> okay, it's better than it depends. Yeah, I, I, it's literally I don't know. Um, and and then I might say, you know, you might have a situation, and and, and someone once told started slapping me, or metaphorically slapping me about I, about it depends. So right. I stopped yeah. using that. I, I tend to say I don't know. Here are the possibilities, if I were to speculate. Uh, but, yeah, I would say I don't know. Well, let's do yeah, something so... stupid next and figure it out, right? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Let me play What's... with it. That's actually, that would be the next thing is let me play with it, which goes back yeah. to Playgrounds. So yeah, same with me. So what is the best sandwich? Chris, I'm so pizza obsessed, I'd say two pieces of pizza on top of each other. Like a calzone kind of idea? Yeah. Calzone, yeah. A or calzone. folded, folded piece of pizza? <laughs> yeah. Or folded pizza, yeah. What ingredients go in that perfect pizza? Oh, the perfect pizza for me. Um, well, I designed it. That's how the the whole Huli Huli thing started. Uh, would probably be a Huli chicken pizza, which technically doesn't exist. I suppose there's a place at Kahuku that makes it, uh, but I, I've actually made it myself. So it's um, Huli Huli chicken, which is a for those who are not from Hawaii. Uh, it's a, a teriyaki uh, spit roasted chicken, uh, essentially. Um, tomato sauce, macadamia nuts, pineapple, and I'm missing one ingredient that I like in there. Oh yeah, goat cheese. Goat cheese, cool. So, so the Huli pizza isn't named after the the company in Silicon Valley TV show. No, no. Oh, it's named after the chicken, the Huli Huli chicken. It's named after chicken. Yeah. Oh, Huli means but... to turn around. Actually, it's it's got two. It's a double meaning in if you're talking about pizza because it's on one side it's the Huli. Huli chicken, which is a rotisserie like this, but people spin their dough like this for a pizza. Oh, okay. About turning around. This is it's the same basic word as from for for the dance hula. It comes from the same root. Is it's oh, okay, cool. It's turning around. So yeah, I assumed it was from the Huli Pizza Huli Company on on Silicon Valley. No, it's actually Huli. It's it's actually a Hawaiian word for turn around. Oh, okay, cool. Well, for, that maybe that may be the me. genesis for Huli for all I know. Um, yeah. What is your most prized possession? Hmm. I'm sure it's <laughs> sitting right here in this room right now. Um, I'd probably say one of my stuffed animals that's over there. Oh, yeah? I'm gonna pull them up. I'll pull them over here. Sure. Uh, well, this, this he is 55 years old. Wow. This cha-cha. Um, the bear? As I, it's a bear. Or I, I got him when we moved originally from, I was what, two and a half? Mm -hmm. uh, when we moved from, when my parents moved from... New York to Rochester, New York, uh, for my dad to go to, to school. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in a very bad car accident on the way. Uh, mm -hmm. We lost everything in the car. Uh, so I was in a very traumatic period just when we got here. We got to Rochester having horrible nightmares. And the doctor said, you need to get him a teddy bear. Mm, okay. And I picked him out. It was it was Christmas time. It's about the time now. So he's probably it's Josh's birthday. Um uh, <laughs> Is uh, and I picked out that bear, and he's been around ever since. Of course, he's got a couple more friends up there now, but uh, right, cool. Um, what's your favorite action movie? Lilo and Stitch. Lilo and Stitch. Cool. That's a hope based in Hawaii. Hawaii. It's based yeah. in Hawaii. Yeah. What number am I thinking Thank of? Twenty six. Nope. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I cut you off on the Lilo and Stitch story. No, I just just yeah, Lilo and Stitch story. I mean, there's the one piece. Of the thing is that. 
this island was cut out of Lilo and Stitch in the original in the uh, like cut out like like removed from the story or removed from the story. There was a scene that happened on Oahu. Oh, okay. And they cut it out because of nine eleven. Oh, really? Because Stitch Stitch starts flying between buildings and crashing into buildings. Oh, he thought that would be too traumatic, so they cut out the the running down the middle of Waikiki. What's the uh, most used app on your phone? Probably Slack. Slack, yeah. That's an easy one for most engineers, I guess, most developers. Yeah. Well, I um, just I I'm I'm in the middle of nowhere. So <laughs> Got to communicate with people. Well, this may be a kind of tricky question, but where would you most like to live? Down the street. <laughs> <laughs> It's a nice house I'm down there. Looking for, I'm actually looking for a house. So yeah, I guess. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> now we live where, where I live now is actually uh, I I want to live on this island, but if I were to pick somewhere to live, um, right now I live in what's essentially mostly military. So mm, I am okay. that direction, three miles is Pearl Harbor. Oh, okay, uh, right. Well, today's Pearl fact, Harbor Day, isn't it? Or tomorrow? Today's Pearl Harbor Day. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, right in my backyard here. Is the fuel tanks for Pearl Harbor, or was the fuel tanks for Pearl Harbor? They're getting de- decommissioned now. But um, so, and in between is all military housing. So this isn't the most conducive neighborhood that I like to live in. It's got a lot of a lot of younger people here uh, who have interests that are a little noisy. Let's put it that way. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> all right. What's the one thing that you own that you should really throw out? Probably all those chocolate bars that I'm stashing away somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't need that many chocolate bars. <laughs> right, right. Let's see. Um, aisle or window? Window. Window? You just like to get in I there and in. just chill? Yeah. No, I like putting the pillow up against the wall. Uh, okay, cool. Have you ever asked anybody for their autograph? Yes. And would you care to expound on that? Um, I was actually three. Okay. Um, that I could think of off the top of my head. One mm-hmm. is Sir Peter Bedouar, who was mm-hmm. Nobel laureate. Okay. Um, he actually borrowed my belt. Uh, which, okay. That's another whole story, but yeah, okay. it's it's a lot story. But I, I got his autograph. Um, Sir Peter Bedouar, David Mack, the artist and art um, uh, cartoon creator, uh, mm-hmm. comic creator. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm blanking on the third now that I'm thinking of it. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, one of the Apollo astronauts. Oh, really? Which one? Um which you mission? Know, I'm blanking it. It was the last mission. It was, it was the last. Oh, last Cernan? Mission. Cernan? Gene Cernan? It was not Lowell. Harrison Schmidt? It was Harrison Schmidt. Okay. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I, I, the, no, Ron Evans. That's his name. Ron Evans. Oh, so the command command module pilot? I think command module pilot. Yeah, cool. Yeah, neat. Yeah, no, I have yeah, a, I have a was, signed, signed Buzz Aldrin picture from uh, Apollo 11 yeah, behind so here. So Ron Evans, because yeah, I was so into space when I was younger. And yeah, that one, same uh, technically my mom asked because he was working for as a subcontractor for a company my mom was working for. Oh, cool. And I had this book of Apollo stuff, and we took took the page out and had him sign it. I don't know what I did with that. <laughs> it's well, around here okay. somewhere, but... Yeah. No, I have a, I, yeah, I have... I got a, a Buzz Aldrin signature at a, com, a convention once. Um, do you have a dream that you remember? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. It's actually kind of freaky because I, I, it's almost it's almost 100 percent come across. Is I was going through a really really bad space in college um, and not feeling and it was a depression. And uh, I had a dream where my wife and I were living along the coast near a forest, and we just and the older me said to the younger me, "It's fine. It's all going to work work out. Don't worry." Right. And that's it? That one, I, that's what it was. I, it was cool. much there, but coast is over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. So you, you sort of have, over there. <laughs> you have come to that. Cool. Um, all right. Well, I guess we, we can probably wrap up. So uh, how would people get in touch with you, Steve? And what um, are you working on next? Well, let's see. Uh, best way to get in touch with me is probably going to be uh, either Mastodon uh, which we'll put the link. I don't have the link in. Yeah, I'll put the link in the notes. Yep. You'll put the link in me for me. Um, is probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. Uh, you can also check out the makeappie.com website. We'll have mm-hmm. a lot of that stuff. And probably my LinkedIn profile is the other place to find me. Is because sure. I'll keep I keep active on those three more than anywhere else. So do you have any idea when your Swift Data course is going to be ready to go? Uh, or we'll see how long it, it it's sometime first quarter. Uh, 2024. 
It's it's a little nebulous right now. There's some issues. Uh, like I said, noise here is a problem with trying to record stuff. So we're having a couple delays on, on me finishing production. So it, once that's done, we, I can then start really cranking out and, and getting the, the, getting the post-production stuff done. And that will then figure out when I, it's actually going to show up. All right. Well, my name is Tim Mitra, T-I-M-M-I-T-R-A on the Twitter machine, the Mastodon machine, Instagram machine, all those places. Usually you'll find me. So until next time, we'll see you later. Bye. Aloha. This has been another episode of the More Than Just Code podcast. If you want to find out more about the show, you can visit the More Than Just Code website at mtjc.fm. There you can find a summary and show notes of each episode. We list links to the apps, code, and news that we mentioned on the show. If you like the podcast, tell your friends. Please leave a comment on the website, and if you can, please write a review on iTunes. And please recommend us in your favorite podcatcher. All of these things help others find out about the show. We really appreciate your help with spreading the word. We're also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd love to hear from you. So use the hashtag AskMTJC. Once again, the podcast Twitter account is at MTJC underscore podcast. Please consider supporting the show by pledging any amount on patreon.com slash MTJC. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time. So are, do you consider yourself an indie developer or do you consider yourself uh, just like you're just working from home this whole time and that's kind of where, you, where you're at? Did COVID change any of that, I guess, this question? Well, COVID changed it big time in the sense that I'm here. I mean, right. you know, the reason I'm here in Hawaii is COVID. Oh, you, moved, that, you moved during COVID? Or? No, no, I didn't move during COVID. What ended up happening was uh, the when COVID started isolating everybody, when we went, went to lockdown. Yeah. In about a week, I converted an entire business from in-office to remote. Okay, right. And then I realized after we had done that, after a year of this, we had come, we, we came back here to vacation, uh, that there's nothing stopping me from doing my job anywhere because this infrastructure is now in place. I could work from almost everywhere for, for about 90% of my job. So and were you actually go going to a physical office before this? Like, were you yes, going yes. like so, somewhere I mean, downtown or whatever? So our office is over by uh, O'Hare Airport. Uh -huh. So uh, we were by the airport. I actually oh, you mean a, you, were, you, were, you were going to the office in Chicago? My Chicago office. Yeah. So I usually went to the Chicago office. During lockdown, I was stuck in downtown Chicago where our, oh, okay. where our apartment was. Okay. And everyone else, I mean... Where the office used to be like this, it blew up like this because people were lived pretty far away from the office in Kansas. Yeah, places. yeah. Um, and so they were all over the suburbs, and it was working great. Mm -hmm. So I asked my boss, and he said, "Sure." Right. <laughs> I was like, "Okay." <laughs> yeah, he's my dad, but even still, I was not, <laughs> oh, I was boss, not expecting yeah. that. <laughs> I was not expecting. Yeah. He's good. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. So we, yeah, because the same thing happened to me. I mean, I I ran my own business from this house for like um, a good ten years or so. And then uh, when the I, when the indie apocalypse happened and I had to go find a day job, um, I went and joined the bank and worked there for about five years, I guess. And then COVID hit and all of us had to like work from home. And, you know, and I even had so like I had, uh, I think I had eight people that were that were working for me as their manager and three out of eight of them, maybe four out of eight of them um, relocated during COVID. They just went that way you know 150 miles or went that way 150 miles and mm -hmm. and stayed there right um yeah. and uh i changed jobs last year but the the bank still had it still has the downtown office and they still expect people now to go in to two days a week kind of thing right um so um i you know whether i work remote or not is is you know i have a couch over there where i wrote most of my code that you know over the last you know 13 years or so um so at night i'm working over there during the day i'm sitting at oops sorry <laughs> During the day, I'm sitting at this desk, and and this is where I work. So, and, and it's kind of nice because even though I'm still at home, this space is I'm working. Right when I get up yeah. and walk away from here, I'm not working anymore unless I'm coding. You know, right? But yeah, cool. Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting time. But uh, um, it's interesting. I was just it, a couple of things I wanted to ask you. I was going to mention during the show is that um, 
um, Apple just, I just saw an article this morning saying Apple's dipping their toe in, in AI just came out like a story just came out. Yeah. Unsurprising, but yeah, I mean, they, they did it. I mean, they did a kind of interesting thing with, with, uh, core ML when they rolled yeah. that out, you know, build your own models and train them and they, you know, some pr- pretty fascinating stuff. And of course, typical of Apple, it became super simple to make something like a, a an object recognizing app. Right? Um, right. And you can see, you can see some of that manifest in the photos app when you can point at a dog and it tells you it's a dog, you yeah. know, <laughs> I was yeah. walking my dog one day and I, and I had my photo, my camera open and put this little square box around my dog as I'm walking. I'm like, Whoa, that's cool. You know, cause it was obviously recognizing that my dog was with me or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It'd be interesting to see where we go with, with this stuff. Right. Um, as you know, I'm big on, um, vision OS right now. So that's my sort of thing. Oh, me too. So yeah, but I, as I keep telling myself, as soon as I become a millionaire, I'll buy one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I had a, I had a, a visual joke that it was supposed to arrive today, but it didn't arrive. So I couldn't make the joke. But anyway, oh. uh, some su- surprise. Maybe maybe for tomorrow's uh, catch up, we'll, uh, I'll surprise you guys with it if, I, if it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's cool. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having and, me. Yeah, we'll see you. I guess it's we'll fun. see you again. Uh, and just, you know, for those of you following the after show at this point in time, we do have a, gr- a working group that we belong to, both of us. Um, that's what's called the iOS. What does he Devin call it? Swift remote, Swift studio. remote studio. Yeah. Swift remote studio. And, uh, yeah, we, we meet here, talk about goals on Friday. We have a coffee meetup on, um, Wednesday, we, uh, Wednesday at noon, I think uh, Eastern time. Yeah. And then, um, which is what? Well, six don't, ask me, don't ask me time zones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Time zones and, and dates. Don't ask us about those. Um, and then, um, what's the other thing? Uh, yeah. So, and then there's a Slack channel where we, so if you're an independent developer and you want to join a community and feel like you're sitting at the water cooler, you can probably join us there. Right. Yeah. Cool. And you can see my, some of my other craziness. Yeah. <laughs> All right, sir. Thanks for your, thanks All for your right. time.